Amor Tolles' historical fiction novel A Gentleman in Moscow, the story of a man confined for life to house arrest in a Moscow hotel, remains one of my absolute favorite novels I've read. The story is so full of heart, uh, beautifully paints its scenes and its characters, and brings in Russian history and literature in a way that's absolutely fascinating. This is a book where the descriptions are so vivid that, for example, I actually tried cooking myself Latvian stew following the chapter on Christmas dinner. A book that got me so interested in Russian history and the Russian Revolution that I subsequently had the urge to read Orlando Figgs' massive account, A People's Tragedy, uh, to learn more about the history and literature alluded to within A Gentleman in Moscow. And a book that even seemed to confer some deeper meaning and value to experiences like a depressive slump or, well, like finding oneself indefinitely quarantined because the world had just pretty much shut down and gone into isolation the month before I read that book. So naturally, I was excited to hear about the release of The Lincoln Highway, uh, Tolles' latest novel, which explores a new cast of characters and a new setting, this time taking readers on a road trip through 1950s America. My family settled on this book for our informal book club, and once we were able to get our hands on it, uh, I think all of us finished it pretty quickly. Which is all the more impressive because this isn't a super fast-moving book. It's not a slow one, but it takes its time to get where it's going. This will be somewhat of a longer discussion than my typical review, so grab a coffee, make yourself comfortable. Uh, I'll also mention right now that there will be some mild spoilers peppered throughout. Nothing that would ruin the adventure for you or anything, but I'm not going to give any big spoilers until the very end, and I'll let you know at that point before I begin discussing the final few chapters. The Lincoln Highway, despite its very different subject matter, it brings back a lot of the charms and the spirit that made A Gentleman in Moscow so successful. Perhaps the most obvious one being its frequent allusions to famous literature, this time with a specific focus on adventures that draws upon Alexander Dumas' The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers, uh, the Greek classics, including most prominently The Odyssey, and even some occasional Shakespeare. And in this way, the Lincoln Highway, like The Gentleman in Moscow before it, uh, sort of becomes an ode to great literature of all sorts. And just like in Toll's previous work, readers who have already read these classics will still find much of interest in the parallels Toll's draws with his own characters, but a deep familiarity with these works is no prerequisite. His characters give us all the most essential details about each work in a way that may even inspire us to later read the full works. And in its form, tone, and setting, this novel also evokes a certain different type of mid-20th century American literature, drawing upon themes of both literal and figurative travel in this road trip the characters find themselves undertaking. But also this classic theme of the pursuit of some elusive sense of the American dream, a theme that was also explored by authors like Steinbeck, and I'm sure also by many others that I haven't read. Well, even also Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun, I'm not saying this novel is just like those classics, but just that it captures an ethos that I think you'll find there as well. Some readers also mention parallels with F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, I don't know, take this all with a grain of salt, uh, but I do think you'll at least see some influences of these literary greats on Tolles' writing. The novel also brings back this theme and stylistic element from A Gentleman in Moscow that involves appreciating the small moments rather than just rushing past them. There's a necessary and valuable conversation with a panhandler at the train station, or a reflection upon one's complicated relationship with a thesaurus. Whether or not you're particularly attached to the overall plot of this journey, these little moments, uh, which are almost standalones except that, of course, every moment in life uh, must be appreciated within some broader context, those little moments were the richest part of the novel. Often they were a lot more interesting than the loose overall plot. They were what kept me each morning getting up and reading more, although this novel does have more of a sense of plot and destination than A Gentleman in Moscow. And perhaps the main character of the novel, Emmett, encourages the reader to appreciate these small moments through his utter disregard for them, his haste to get to San Francisco without an hour lost. Yes, I, as pretty much everyone else I've heard from, found Emmett to be a bit of a bore, as was likely the author's intention, but we'll get to that more soon. This novel explores many themes at various levels of depth, including probably some that the author didn't directly intend to explore, but sort of just emerged from his writing. Among the more consciously and saliently written ones, we have an exploration of travel, physically and metaphorically, through life. Characters who set their eyes on one destination and then find themselves somewhere totally different. Characters who find that to get to where they want to be, they first have to get to the halfway point, and then halfway to the halfway point, and then halfway to the half half point. Characters contemplating whether they're at the start, middle, or the end of their life journey. And in their best moments, 
character is even breaking free from all of these metaphorical conceptualizations that we create as humans to describe our life's journey, but that then sometimes constrain us more than they offer us any real lasting purpose or direction. We also have this idea of settling one's balance, whether financially or morally. One of our characters, Duchess, becomes especially attached to this idea, and it leads him throughout the novel to settle a bunch of scores with old adversaries, sometimes in his favor and sometimes to his detriment. While readers probably won't agree with the ways in which Duchess settles his balances in all cases, we can't help but admire the apparent elegance in the systematic way he approaches this task. And it also gives him some sort of implicit reliability in spite of the fact that he's generally a loose cannon in other ways. We can see that at least in his quest to balance his moral ledger, he's diligent and unbending. Of course, this form of accounting often contrasts with other characters' intuitions. His former jailmate Townhouse is utterly baffled when Duchess shows up on his Harlem stoop with a strange request. And despite Duchess's conviction that he's done the right thing by settling the balance here, readers will probably be as unconvinced as Townhouse himself that Duchess's so-called good deed was really actually necessary or offered any real benefit for the other parties involved. And in Duchess's laser focus on a few key life events that he deems worthy of making it onto his list for repayment, we can't help but wonder whether it's blinding him to a bunch of other mistakes that he's making along the way that simply don't register. And of course, in keeping with Toll's traditionally literarily inspired writing style, we also have a re-exploration of several timeless themes, uh, such as that of the tragic hero. Many of the characters in this novel could be construed as tragic heroes, sometimes maybe a little too much so. Ulysses, for example, is a character who will likely make us a little uncomfortable by the time of his exit, because while most of the characters optimistically interpret the parallels between his story and the Odyssey as meaning he's going to reunite with his wife and child in just a few years, we as readers know there's no guarantee, and that frankly there are other ways his life could go, some of which are probably more likely, but could be fulfilling in very different ways. Uh, Tolls also explores the idea of tragic flaws within his characters, an idea that is thought-provoking, but maybe also a little too obvious by the end when Billy tells us this is what's happening. But maybe my ambivalent reaction to this idea is partly because, as I'll get to in a bit, I wasn't quite as convinced that the tragic flaw Billy saw in his brother was really sufficiently developed in Emmett's characterization. Uh, I think everyone in my family book club who read this book enjoyed the novel, at least somewhat, as did I, and I'd certainly recommend it, especially if you're a fan of the way Amor Tolls writes on a micro level, uh, constructing his sentences and paragraphs, and, and these little anecdotes in the midst of larger narratives. That's all as present here as ever. However, I do have to say that the Lincoln Highway uh, didn't quite hit me in the same way that A Gentleman in Moscow did. It didn't feel quite so tight and perfectly executed. And for me, some of that came down to the way the cast of characters were presented and explored. In A Gentleman in Moscow, all the action or inaction centers upon this one central character, the Gentleman in Moscow, Count Rostov. There are plenty of other characters developed to varying depths, each feeling perfectly appropriate. In The Lincoln Highway, however, a similar length book, we bounce around between eight different point of view characters. And as we all know, this isn't an authorial decision to be taken lightly, uh, as placing readers within a character's mind carries with it certain obligations. Once we're in a character's head, that character's actions and personality require more nuance, explanation, and justification than if we were simply to be viewing them from an outsider's perspective, in which case it would be understood that we're not getting as full of a picture. Furthermore, as soon as we've been granted access to a character's point of view, that character implicitly carries more importance in the reader's mind. There must be a reason why we're given that point of view. So my first problem with several of the minor POV characters in this novel is that they don't really seem to justify their own inclusion within this select group. For example, and I'll be getting more into some, some minor spoilers here just as a warning, uh, why was Professor Abacus Abernathy given a POV? I mean, he's been great as a character up until this point, but it seems like he was given his own chapter simply to convey to us some moral about life being shaped like a diamond, Zeno's paradox, life isn't over yet even if you think you're really old and you've already seen the best of it, blah, blah, blah. And okay, I'll give it to the author. This, this is an interesting point. Uh, but I think that there were other, more subtle ways and interesting ways of exploring this theme, including many that we do see at other points in the book. Sure, Professor Abernathy's reflections don't feel too in your face and in and of themselves, but because he's explicitly given this chapter and because his story simply isn't that deep here, his chapter simply feels too much like a moral, and because of that, I don't think his POV chapter fits so seamlessly within the narrative. 
And then there's another character that I definitely think shouldn't have been given a POV. Pastor John, what is this guy doing here? Again, this character feels like he's there sort of as a moral or lesson to us, maybe as a contrast with some of the more sympathetic religious characters in the book. And he's neither interesting nor even understandable. This guy might as well just be evil incarnate because we really learn nothing about his motivations. He feels just like a stock figure there to teach us a lesson. And this might have been okay if he simply appeared to rob Billy on the train and then to introduce us to Ulysses, who came to save Billy. And then he was promptly booted from the train and from the novel. But this character returns then again later. And what's worse, he gets his own POV. And that's a real problem with Pastor John because his point of view doesn't really offer any insight beyond what we would have inferred from simply observing him through the other characters. He just confirms our shallow impressions of him. He's some kind of pseudo-religious fanatic, although really he just comes across more as a lunatic because although he's quoting scripture throughout, we get no sense of where this relationship to Christianity originates from. It just seems like it's a means of authority for him. I just couldn't quite believe him because his POV chapters just don't give him a clear enough underlying motivation. Not to mention the fact that this is our clear racist character, our clear zealous fanatic, etc., and is in no way relatable, actually makes it easier for us readers to just place him in the stocks and pillory him to morally distance ourselves from this evil nutcase without drawing any valuable parallels to our own lives. And this will contrast with one of the other characters that I'll talk about, the best written character in the novel. And in fact, it makes me feel a little bit like maybe Pastor John was included in the novel solely to establish a measuring stick of what a truly evil character would look like so that we can question whether this other character measures up to that. Uh, beyond even those characters, we have a few other minor POV characters that feel like they do belong, uh, but we're maybe given POVs, at least partly as token representatives of certain minorities. We have Ulysses, the black character, a pretty all-around good guy who has an interesting story and who will be pretty much universally admired by all readers, in, in spite of a few real past mistakes or difficult decisions he's had to make. Contrast him, though, with another black character, Townhouse, who's clearly a minor character and for whom we never get a POV chapter. But because of this, he actually ends up being more of a complicated person in the reader's eyes, and thus I'd argue is more interesting than Ulysses because of this element of mystery, of speculation that he invites. And we also have Sally, the woman, uh, also a fun and I think quite believable character, but again, who falls somewhere in this gray area where she's not absent enough to be an afterthought, but she's also clearly not a main character here. Which, okay, one could argue that this in fact does reflect the level of attention that society played to women and to black men at the time. All in all, I really did like Sally as a character in herself. Uh, she was very believable as a person, and I say one of the best developed characters in terms of her nuanced views and her personality, but she's just not so relevant to the main thrust of the novel. And because of this jumping away from the main characters every so often and into Sally's or Ulysses' threads, did certainly disrupt the main narrative in a way that I guess you just have to be ready for when reading a story like this with so many points of view. That's not to say that these characters shouldn't have been included at all. I'm just pondering whether they might have worked better simply as characters who are introduced through the eyes of other main characters. I mean, I'll admit that would have been pretty hard for Sally because we would not have gotten the same level of nuance seeing her through Emmett. I mean, Emmett doesn't understand her at all. It may sound like a slight to someone making them a non-POV character, but in other ways, it's actually really a gift for them, a way of giving them some space, uh, like what we saw for Townhouse or for Wooly's sister, Sarah. Like, still thinking about comparisons between Sarah and Sally, I guess it does make some sense that Sally should get her own point of view chapters as someone who's really decided to seize life by the horns, in contrast with Sarah, who has become quite defeated through years of a marriage of convenience and a general disillusionment of what life has to offer her. Having thought through all of this though, maybe the inclusion of Abacus in just one chapter towards the end is also a little bit symbolic. Uh, maybe it illustrates the fact that a character who has until now considered his life mostly done for, uh, past his prime, that he now has an epiphany that propels him to take back his own life and seize what remains of the day. So yeah, I guess after reflecting more on this, I have more complicated feelings about who was and wasn't included as POV characters. And I think I have a little more appreciation for what Amor Tolls was doing with them. Except Pastor John. I, I still don't get Pastor John. Please leave me a comment though if you understand Pastor John or any of these characters differently than I did, because I think all of them invite many interpretations. What about the main characters, the, the four musketeers? I think they're kind of a mixed bag. Billy, the young boy, is the D'Artagnan of the novel, if you want to go with the parallels to 
the Three Musketeers. He's the one who's there observing, adventuring, and documenting the experiences of the more so-called important Central Three characters. Billy's a bit challenging to read simply because, as a precocious young boy, his character often falls somewhere in this territory where he feels like he's too mature and knows too much to be just eight years old, but then occasionally we get these sharp reminders of just how young he really is. But beyond simply being an avid reader and knowing lots of trivia and all that, which is pretty believable to me, he doesn't quite capture the maturity level of a nine-year-old in my eyes. He seems a little too skilled at reading other characters' emotions and motivations. I mean, it's a rare eight-year-old who would tell his 18-year-old brother to count to ten first before the next time he hits someone. Still, I don't mind Billy as a character, even though he's not someone where I spent too much time dissecting or exploring his motivations. He's, he's really more of a catalyst. Um, and he's also there so that sometimes he can just make us pause for a second, observe and appreciate what's going on around us, and just have some sense of wonder for the things we take for granted. And that he does, because in this way he exists in complete opposition to his brother Emmett. So Emmett is arguably the main character of the novel if you had to pick one, and definitely the most boring character when considering the ratio between the number of pages centered on him and his actual depth of character. Now, in some ways, I think this was intended because most of the other reviews I watched said the same thing. I certainly didn't see anyone saying Emmett was their favorite. Yes, Emmett was meant to be boring. He was meant to illustrate the dangers of just being so set on some rigid goal, you know, getting to California, that we miss everything going on around us, which contrasts deeply with a character like his brother Billy, who also wants to get to California, but who enjoys every single minute of the journey and is willing to consider the fact that things might work out a little differently than planned. Unfortunately, I found that in his efforts to characterize Emmett as this kind of boring, uncurious character, Tolls often goes a little too far, even to the point where Emmett becomes a little unbelievable. He becomes more of a cutout character who's there to keep reminding us, like, shouldn't we get going soon? I really wanted to feel Emmett's internal conflict. Maybe some tiny sense of curiosity battling with this dominating and urgent feeling that we just need to get a move on it. But we really never got that here, and I think it made Emmett fall flat, even for a character who is designed to be about as flat as they get. But also because of Emmett's lack of a real characterization, it was hard for me to really buy into Emmett's supposed tragic flaw of anger. He never really conveyed to me quite the level of anger that we were told by Billy and the author that he had. Sure, Duchess got under his skin, but his reaction to Duchess felt simply like normal responses to such a character, and they felt to me more like a passive frustration than real seething anger, especially for someone who has done quite harmful things to him. So another main character we have is the lovable but lost Wooly Wolcott. Wooly is like Lenny uh, in Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, the sort of tragic character where the world feels just too scary and dangerous a place for him. In fact, this isn't even just me who saw this. Uh, I was watching another group's YouTube discussion where a participant drew the exact same parallel between Lenny and Wooly. At the very beginning of this novel, I have to admit Wooly bored me, maybe even more than Emmett at first, and I think part of that is because we're kind of set up by the other characters' descriptions of him to feel this way. Well, that and we're told from the start that he's on his medicine, which we assume to be some kind of a tranquilizer or opiate, and which makes us immediately question how much of his core personality we're seeing at this point, rather than a medicine-induced stupor. In any case, we're probably all apt to underestimate him at first, but even as we gradually confirm that this isn't just the medicine clouding his mind, it really is the way he is. He really grows on you, and for me, ends up being one of the best characters in the novel. Wooly is a guy with some kind of mental disability. Some people see him as simple, but viewing the world through his eyes, I love that we see a richer perspective of what that actually entails in this particular case. We quickly learn that Wooly is far from dumb or empty-headed as he might appear to the outside world. He's actually quite clever and thoughtful in many ways. It's just that he tends to easily become overwhelmed by diverging possibilities and by the confusing or unsettling or frightening ideas that pop into his head in a way that trips him up and, of course, makes him come across to those around him as mentally absent. I think the scene describing his confrontation with the thesaurus really conveys Wooly's inner experience in a vivid and relatable way. And because of this, I found him a believable, relatable, and ultimately very lovable character, which maybe is to be expected for someone whose name evokes like a teddy bear. <laughs> Finally, though, there's Duchess, the performer, the thief, the vigilante with his own unique but consistent sense of justice, and much more. 
Despite him not being the official main character of this book, although I have heard this debated in many of the discussion circles I listen to on YouTube, in a certain sense he really is the main character because he's the most complicated character, the most interesting character, and although Emmett's the one we're first introduced to at the start of the novel, who is it that we see in the last scene making his glorious exit? Emmett can certainly be frustrating at times, but if there's one character who will make us conflicted in the best possible way, it's Duchess. Here's a guy who's just a joy to read, who has such a personality and really just injects life into the book in every encounter, then one who narrates his own POV chapters in first person, unlike any of the other characters except Sally, the one who really drives along the plot as he drives away in his stolen car whenever things are finally starting to shape up for our would-be hero Emmett. By the end of the book, I think most of us still won't quite know what to make of Duchess. I mean, we've given him a bunch of chances and he keeps disappointing us. Everything he does feels self-serving, and yet, is he completely devoid of empathy or regard for any of the other characters? Has he done anything that unequivocally proves he doesn't care at all about Wooly or Emmett or Billy? Readers will disagree on this point, and I think there's evidence for either side of the argument, and I myself still remain undecided there. But this ambiguity that remains to the end isn't because Duchess is an inconsistent or poorly written character. He's only inconsistent in ways that feel totally believable, and for me, Duchess was hands down the best character here. So yeah, I thought the characters were a mixed bag, with major characters like Duchess and Wooly coming out strongest, but with Emmett and even Billy falling a little bit short, not to mention a few of the less compelling minor POV characters like Pastor John. But Tolles asserts himself in his own short commentary video, which I'll link in the video description, along with many of the others that I've talked about. He says that once he'd written this book, he simply couldn't imagine the story with any one of these eight perspectives missing. Uh, together, they were what gives this tale its unique richness and its texture. Now I want to give a bigger spoiler warning before I wrap up with some discussion of the ending, and I will say that there are some surprises here, so think twice before continuing if you haven't read it yet. A few major surprises come at the end of the novel. Wooly takes his own life with an overdose of medicine, an action that has been foreshadowed in the second half of the novel as we've begun to see just how turbulent Wooly's inner life is, but one that still came as a jolt to me nevertheless. And in Duchess's carelessness or his eagerness to get at Wooly's fortune, he fails to protect his supposed friend in this critical moment, making us question Duchess's true motivations for being Wooly's friend. Some readers have even speculated that Duchess left the medicine bottle there on purpose in the spice rack where Wooly would stumble upon it, and therefore that this action was more than neglect, it was an intentional pushing Wooly towards the suicide. I do think it's hard to rule out this possibility. I mean, why would Duchess have put the medicine there instead of throwing it away? At the same time, though, it doesn't seem quite in character for a man who's trying to settle his karmic balance by atoning for all his past wrongs, unless he's somehow managed to convince himself that this is an accident or something that Wooly would have wanted. Then Emmett and Billy arrive, and when Emmett discovers what's happened to Wooly, it leads to a confrontation between himself and Duchess in which Duchess pulls out a rifle and aims it at our hapless young Billy, who is not all that alarmed. Because unlike Duchess, he can read, so he knows that the gun is not loaded, and further that Duchess needs him and Emmett to read Wooly's note bequeathing one-third of his fortune to Duchess. Duchess backs down and plays off his actions as merely a bluff, claiming he never would have actually harmed Billy or Emmett. An assertion that readers may or may not believe, because although it's true that he never has harmed either of them yet in a fatal sense, He's also taken advantage of them several times at this point to get his way without ever demonstrating to them any good faith in his ultimate intentions. At this point, this is just too much for Emmett, who, after knocking Duchess out cold, puts him and his share of the inheritance on a boat in this sort of rigged-up escape scenario where Duchess, who we and Emmett know by now cannot swim, can only access the money by moving to the front of the boat, but by doing so, he will submerge the front part of the hull which he knows to contain a hole, thus flooding the boat and causing it to sink with him in it. As the wind picks up and the bills start blowing off the stack one by one, Duchess cannot contain his greed, and he moves forward to collect the money, leading to his own glorious exit from the stage. So I personally enjoyed the ending for what it was, but I gathered that it was also unsatisfying for a lot of readers for fair reasons, uh, most prominently that many people simply don't buy that Emmett would have acted in this way. First of all, would he have really chosen to take Wooly's inheritance rather than leave it behind when it was never his intention to claim it in the first place? 
yes, Wooly willed him the inheritance, but we've seen that Emmett is a guy with real moral scruples, and his decisions certainly would have made him super uncomfortable. And then, would Emmett have left Wooly or Wooly's body behind without reporting it, so that basically he's fleeing what could be construed as a murder scene, and also leaving all this uncertainty for Wooly's family and his sister most importantly. But then, finally, would Emmett really have rigged up this escape situation in which Dutch just has to choose between his own greed for Wooly's inheritance and his own life? Not only does Emmett lack the imagination or deviousness to invent such an escape scenario, I think many readers also would find it more in Emmett's character to just drop Duchess at the police station, the actual police station, not the river, euphemistically referred to as the police station earlier in the novel, and then be on his way. Or even more believably for what we know of Emmett, to just show up at the police station, explain the whole situation, and get sent back to Salina for another gig when the policemen don't buy his story. Maybe all these things really are what Emmett would have chosen, but the last chapters provide so little insight into his final decision that it's fair for readers to be puzzled just what was going on in Emmett's head there. And for me, this is where Emmett's weak characterization throughout the novel really causes problems, because readers find themselves having to take the author's word that these are the actions Emmett took, and we have to fill in the reasons for why he would have taken these actions that are not to be taken lightly. And this is simply hard to do for a character that seems so bland up to this point. Not only this, but we also have to believe that Billy, who we've learned by now as a child with a lot of heart and not nearly as clueless as others might think, would agree to this plan without much of a fight. So although this final scene feels very Steinbeckian, the characters don't quite add up in a way that really leaves us convinced that they all acted consistently with their personalities. One other more minor criticism I heard from some readers was that a lot of the earlier loose threads, such as those involving Abacus Abernathy and Ulysses, weren't quite tied up to everyone's satisfaction, making the ending feel a little bit premature for some readers. And why does Duchess, as the life fades from him, see a vision of Sally with a baby? It sure didn't seem like that was the first thing in the cards for Sally, based on her last monologue, but of course life works in unexpected ways. These things didn't bother me too much because I don't mind leaving some aspects to speculation, apart from the fact that I think a few of them, like the Abacus Abernathy diversion, are ones that could have been omitted entirely. And actually one participant in a YouTube discussion I watched put it well when he said, Amor Tolls knows what the reader wants, getting to meet Billy and Emmett's mother, seeing Ulysses reunite with his family, a showdown between Duchess and his father, etc but he doesn't give it to us if it's not going to enhance the greater story. Although I would argue that sometimes he does give it to us here. I think once in a while he goes for the crowd-pleasing decision instead of sticking to the bare essentials, more than in A Gentleman in Moscow. But it's the sign of a good writer when he does achieve this, and not something that I could easily do myself, I'm sure. I mean, even the name of the novel is kind of a huge red herring, though I didn't notice it until the whole book was said and done. I don't think our characters have even set foot or set tire on the Lincoln Highway uh, until this book is already over. But all in all, I found the sparse but existent plot of this novel enjoyable, and it was a joy seeing where the adventure took us through the unexpected twists and turns of life and of death. So if you like Amor Tolles' work, or if you've never read him before but the idea of his style sounds appealing, I'd encourage you to give this a read. Now, thanks for watching, and happy reading.